Hi, everyone. So today I'm going to be talking about uh, course sets for scalable Bayesian inference. Um, and so, well, what is a course set? Well, it's uh, it's a pretty simple idea. That usually, for uh, when we're trying to do scalable Bayesian inference on extremely large data sets, uh, the standard approach is to come up with some new algorithm because our venerable, you know, say, MCMC algorithms like HMC are just too slow. So we come up with some uh, great new algorithm. Uh, but you know, if you're like me and you're kind of lazy and you just want to use Stan, uh, you don't have to do any work. And so you want to avoid coming up with something new. Uh, and so what if instead of coming up with a new algorithm, you just change your data and you made your data smaller? So that's basically what a course set is. It's just a small weighted subset of your, your original data set. Uh, and now that you have this small, Data set, you can uh, run your standard algorithm on it quite efficiently. Now, and the beauty of the course set idea is that these course sets are very easy to construct. You essentially determine the importance of your, your data points, uh, you use that uh, to form an importance distribution, you do important sampling, uh, and you're done. And that's it. And uh, moreover, so one of the, the features of a lot of these new algorithms is that they work either in parallel or in streaming settings. And uh, the great thing is with the core set is that you can also construct them uh, in parallel and in streaming. Okay, so let's get into this in a bit more detail. So we have our large data set. And they're saying we might want to run you know, random walk image. Mala, HMC, something like that. But we're going to be extremely slow. Right? Each iteration of this algorithm is going to scale linearly, typically, with the amount of data we have. Perhaps even worse if we're trying to, um, right, but typically, typically linearly. So, okay, we'll just change the algorithm. We've got stochastic variational inference, streaming variational phase. Subsampling, MCMC methods, consensus algorithms, there's all sorts of great stuff out there. Uh, and these are designed to cost much less than the amount of data that we have per iteration, right? So SVI and subsampling, MCMC, they just subsample a small amount of data at each iteration. Streaming VB only looks at each data point once. Uh, consensus algorithms are able to work in parallel. Uh, but the, the price we typically pay for all these is that we introduce some sorts of some sort of approximation or heuristic. Uh, and these usually eliminate the theoretical guarantees, even asymptotically, that we have for, say, these more standard algorithms. Uh, furthermore, there's been a lot of work just to develop uh, good, good ways of um, using these. For example, like if, if we want to use these adaptively, what um, what um, acceptance rate should we target, right? So even things as simple as that, we're, we're not quite sure uh, what to do once we get to this new regime. So, okay. Let's just replace all that data with just a few data points. And sort of, uh, hopefully you can sort of see the idea here is that we have this core set where now we've weighted our data points. So we have some points in the middle here, which are essentially big and representative of the, the typical data that we receive. But we also maintain these outliers uh, for the, the sort of special, uh, more unique points. And then we just run the course up through our standard algorithm. And now it only costs whatever the size of the course is per iteration. Furthermore, to get the streaming distributed uh, algorithms is quite simple. Basically, we rely on the following fact, which is that if we have two data sets, D1 and D2, uh, a core set for D1 combined with a core set for D2, that's going to be a core set for the combined data sets as well. Okay, so how do we actually construct this? Well, here's the high level view. The first thing we do is we calculate a quantity called the sensitivity. We do this for each data point. And the sensitivity just tells us uh, 
how much this data point can affect our likelihood. So here we are. I'm now representing the sensitivities by the size of the data points. These outliers, they have large sensitivities. They can have large effect on our inference. More common ones in the middle, smaller sensitivities. So intuitively speaking, uh, we want to be sure to include these uh, points with large sensitivities, and the smaller ones are less important. So what we're going to do is we're just going to sample our data points uh, proportionally to their sensitivities. Great. So now we have this much smaller data set. But, of course, uh, this isn't actually the weighting that we want. Uh, what we want to do is we want to weight the points inversely to their sensitivity, because this is basically an important sampler. The true distribution would be essentially uniform over our data points, because we've seen each data point once. And so uh, we're just going to weight by the inverse. And we're done. Now, as you can see, our outlier points, they have uh, small weights. They essentially are just representing themselves, while the inner points are uh, stand-ins for many common points. Uh, and so the important thing here, too, is that essentially this operation, it's, it's obviously going to be linear in the data set size, but we only need to do it once. And uh, then we can just run our, our, our algorithm quickly. So just to kind of give the scale here, um, for some of the data sets we looked at, you know, it might take less than two hours to run 10,000 iterations of uh, MTMC on the core set, whereas it might take over two days for the full data set. But hopefully, the inferences that we get are quite similar. Okay, so that's a high level look. Let's um, into a bit more detail. So, imagine we have some full data set D, uh, which consists of n points. And this um, capital L is our negative log likelihood which is just going to be a sum of negative log likelihood terms for each data point. And we'll form our posterior in the standard way, uh, normalizing by um, z, which is the marginal likelihood. When you move to poor set land, things look pretty similar, uh, except now we've introduced these weights gamma for each data point that we have, and we only have some m number of data. So where these weights show up is just in our negative log likelihood calculation. So now we weight each of those uh, negative log likelihood terms by, um, by this gamma. And the approximate posterior looks exactly like what you would expect. So the guarantee we're going to aim for uh, on our approximate negative log likelihood is this multiplicative error guarantee. So the point being that we'll, we'll have a smaller error in exactly the regions where the negative log likelihood is small, i.e. where the um, posterior has large uh, probability or large mass. Now, one result we can get uh, is that if this multiplicative error holds, uh, we can get a good estimate of our of the log of our marginal problem, uh, marginal likelihood. <coughs> okay, so I keep talking about this sensitivity quantity uh, and um, talking in pretty vague terms. So, <laughs> what does this thing actually look like? Uh, it's really quite simple. It's just uh, comparing the contribution to negative log likelihood from this one data point, Zn, uh, and comparing it to the full likelihood. Right? So just what proportion of our negative log likelihood is accounted for by this one data point? In particular, if we look over all possible parameter uh, values, what's the most that this one data point can account for? 
So the intuition here is that if this data point can uh, say be really is really influential, say this value goes to one, that says that the only theorem that matters is the, the, this one data point, right? Nothing else is important. So if that's true, clearly it's going to be pretty important. Uh, unsurprisingly, in general, this is going to be intractable to calculate. So we're going to look for some upper bound, uh, sigma bar n, to the sensitivity, uh, which we can calculate quickly. Uh, another important quantity is going to be the total sensitivity. And the intuition here is that if we can make every data point important, right, so if we can make that, that um, upper bound be close to one, then we basically need to consider all our data, right? It's only if we have redundancy in our data that we can use some, some sort of subsampling approach. Okay, so say we've calculated some upper bound on our sensitivities. Now we need to sample them. The first step is just going to be to normalize by the total sensitivity to create a probability distribution over our data. Uh, next, we're going to actually form our core set, which will have size m. Uh, so the size of our core set is going to scale essentially linearly in the total sensitivity, right? So it's how hard our problem is. And uh, like one over epsilon squared, where epsilon is that um, approximation factor we're getting. So for each, uh, each point we want on our core set, we just sample an index from P. Uh, we make that that mth point in our core set. Uh, and we wait by the inverse, uh, with one over m just being a normalization term. And that's it. We've got our core set. We can form our uh, log likelihood and our posterior. So here at NIPS, we applied this idea to core sets for logistic regression. There's been quite a bit of previous work on core sets, but they've tended to focus, first of all, not on Bayesian applications, and second of all, on um, clustering type models where your parameter is representing the distance between um, itself and, um, you know, is, is a cluster center, basically, and so it's, um, you know, a distance from your data points to your parameter. Uh, we want to look at something a bit different, but uh, also an important class of models where we are taking inner products between our uh, data and our parameters. So, uh, our data is just uh, covariates uh, xn uh, and um, labels y which we view as being either plus or minus one. Our parameter uh, lives in the same space as the covariates. And we can form our negative log like negative terms. We'll also end up needing this auxiliary clustering to get our sensitivity upper bounds. Right? So those sensitivities are you know, the key to the whole algorithm, and uh, this clustering will help us get those. So, before giving you the upper bound, I just want to mention one important fact, which is that to get any kind of non-trivial result here, uh, we need to assume that our parameter space is bounded. This is basically because we're getting this uniform guarantee, and if we don't do this, uh, we can kind of point our theta in the direction of one of our data points and just make theta really, really big, and eventually that data point is the only one that's going to matter. So, uh, in order to get any kind of non-trivial result, we have to assume that data is bounded. So in particular, we'll assume that data is an L2 ball centered at zero with radius r. And our, you know, I don't want to dwell too much on the details of this upper bound, just enough to say that it's not very hard to calculate, okay? Uh, so it's one plus a sum over our clusterings, and i is the number of points that are in the data that are assigned to cluster i, and then we have e to the negative r times the distance between the cluster center and our data point. And that's it. So, um, 
and, and we're basically done. So the point is that we can calculate all these in time of order k times n. So I want to turn to some empirical results. And the first natural question that you might ask is, OK, I've made you get this extra k cluster. That seems kind of annoying. Um, solving this other potentially hard problem. But it turns out that the details of this clustering are not very important. Uh, so first of all, the value of k really doesn't matter. So here I'm showing the total sensitivity on the y-axis and the size of the data set on the, on the x-axis. And uh, I've plotted different values of k than the total sensitivity values that you get. These are obviously upper bounds. And the point is that they basically all give the same results, no matter how we choose k. If anything, we find that as we make k better, bigger, we get worse results. So, great. We want to choose k small. That's going to give us the best, uh, best approximation. Moreover, this k is basically just giving us the macro structure of our data. And so, choosing a really, really high quality clustering is just not that important. So, even if we have millions of data points, we found that empirically it suffices just to say, subsample 10,000, do your clustering on those data points, and then go from there. So uh, it doesn't add that much overhead to find this clustering. So in fact, of course, that construction is quite fast. Here I'm plotting a bunch of different data sets that we considered and showing what happens as we increase the core set size, uh, the data set size or sizes are fixed. Uh, and comparing the time we spend to actually create the core set uh, divided by the time to run MCMC, in this case, I think it was 10,000 iterations. And except, and I should say, this is MCMC on the core set that we've created. Right? So this is to, to do the inference in our core set. And as you can see, unless the core set is really, really small, the time spent creating this core set relative to the time you need to do inference uh, is, is, is not that uh, significant. So here's some results. This is for a fairly low dimensional synthetic data set. As you can see, uh, and, and this is showing the um, negative task lock likelihood on some held out data. And as you can see, the core set uh, substantially outperforms random. So random here is just what happens if, instead of doing this fancy important sampling, we just look at a random subset of our data that's the same size as our core set uh, and use that as our approximation uh, of the full data set. So as you can see, uh, until we get to the point where we're basically doing as well as the full data set, uh, we, can get, we can more quickly get good results with, with the core set. Now we looked at some higher dimensional data sets, and things started working a le little less well. In this intermediate regime, we're doing moderately better, but not substantially. Uh, here's another larger data set. We're basically uniformly outperforming the random subsampling, but uh, the improvement is somewhat marginal. So why is this? Well, there's something I've kind of hidden from you, which is that uh, all these results depend, first of all, on the dimension of the data. So uh, both of these real data sets are on the order of 100 to 150 uh, dimensions versus the 10 dimensional data I showed at first. So that seems to be one source of the problem, where the, the size of the core set needs to scale up substantially uh, as you get uh, higher dimensional data. But we have a number of exciting directions that we're working on that we think are really going to uh, improve uh, the performance of these core sets. So one is just to generalize them to other models, especially other GLM models, like Poisson regression or robust regression. Uh, which are used um, quite commonly in, in industry and other practical applications where they have large, uh, really large data sets. So um, we think we can get similar results there. So as I just mentioned, we're struggling once we get to moderate to high dimension. So we have some exciting work where we're able to actually make the dependence on uh, the core set independent of the dimension of the data itself. 
And finally, well, to supposedly talk about um, doing Bayesian inference. So was the guarantee that I showed you at the beginning really the right one for Bayesian inference? As it turns out, no. So there's the multiplicative guarantee again. Seems good, right? We're going to do better in regions of higher posterior probability. That's what we want. But here's the problem. With log, with log likelihoods, we have arbitrary additive constants, essentially, that can possibly be there. And those arbitrary additive constants will affect this bound. They matter, right? If I add some constant C to L and L tilde, uh, it doesn't affect the left-hand side at all. But I get to add a plus C here, and so I can basically make epsilon smaller without changing the quality of the approximation. So we need to get rid of that. So here's an idea for how to do that. Well, what we should do is we should just shift our likelihood over so that uh, at its minimum, this is, I, sh I should say, this is a negative log likelihood, so um, you know, minimizing is, is better, smaller values are better. Uh, we should shift it over so that its minimum will be at zero. And what this means then is that if we try to perform well relative to this, we're really going to nail the mode of the distribution and anything near the mode that has high posterior mass. So if we have this kind of guarantee, we can get more than just a guarantee on our uh, marginal, um, sorry, the, the <coughs> marginal likelihood of our data being close to the true value. Uh, we can actually get guarantees on the, the KL divergence. <coughs> So with that, I'll wrap up. Uh, I'd just like to thank my collaborators, uh, Trevor, Tamara, and uh, Dan Feldman. Uh, we have a paper here at NIPS, which I encourage you to check out, uh, as well as code available. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, are there any questions? Yeah, okay, so that's a great question. So it was asked whether we could draw uh, many instances of core sets. And I think this is a promising idea, um, right? Just so we could imagine replacing the uniform random subsampling that we use in SVI or subsampling MCMC methods with the influence distribution that we get from core sets. I think this is a really promising idea. Um, the key is just to make sure that uh, that, that um, non-uniform random subsampling is sufficiently fast. So you'd want to do things like break it into groups that have sort of similar sensitivities and sort of put uniform bounds so that you're not having to run through your data set inefficiently to find those subsets. But yes, I think that's a really promising uh, direction. And in fact, um, you can imagine that these sorts of sensitivity bounds, if you find that they're fairly uniform, that does suggest that doing uniform random sampling isn't such a bad idea, right? might suggest why these methods are actually working pretty well. So, um, great talk, by the way. Uh, first, my, my first question is basically, aren't you imposing something like your model biases on data set selection? Because it seems to me as if what you're actually computing, correct me if I'm wrong about this, is P of model comma X tilde, where X tilde is a new data set given X, instead of just model given X. I'm not sure I'm quite fine. So, I mean, certainly our goal is to approximate the posterior of the data that we're given. Sure, but you're yeah. throwing away data points that seem to have, or at least this is how I understand it, that have little sensitive meaning. Aren't you just selecting the data points that fit the model? Uh, no, not necessarily. I mean, we're just, we're selecting data points that affect the model. Okay. So, so typically what you find is that you have these um, points that are kind of out in the tail, so to speak, and are unique, and those are going to have large sensitivity. And then most of your data points, which are the quote unquote typical ones, uh, are going to have low sensitivity. But there are going to be a lot of them. So you're going to tend to at least select a few of those, plus the outliers. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Uh, yeah, so we're, the question was are we sampling with or without replacement? And the answer is with replacement. Because we're doing non uniform sampling, it's a little tricky to say what um, with without replacement means. Yeah. Yep. Uh, 
to what extent the IID assumption is key to this method? Does it also apply to things like Gaussian processes? Yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, I think that's another really exciting direction for research is how can we move this to something like Gaussian processes, which already have methods that sort of feel like this, like the inducing point methods, where you look at some small number of data points to replace it. And so you can definitely imagine that using these sorts of techniques, we could make those inducing point methods um, uh, work on a better foundation. Sure, sure. So what you'll do is you'll um, you'll get a big chunk of data. Uh, you'll find a core set for that. Then you'll get a new a new chunk of data, and you can add on what was your core set and merge that with your new data, and then find a core set for that new sort of core set plus old core set plus new data, um, and then keep kind of repeating this. And you sort of do it in a um, sort of binary tree fashion. Uh, and this limits uh, sort of the error buildup. But basically what happens in this case is you do have to increase your course out a little bit, but it only has to grow logarithmically in the amount of data that you have. Yeah, yeah, you can set it up so you don't really pay in terms of error. Okay, uh, thank our speaker again, please.